all for coming, and uh, th special thanks to uh, the team from St. Joseph's High School. Uh, the talk, as you can see, is on welding, and uh, the speaker today would be Dr. Patricio Mendez. A little background on Dr. Mendez, he's uh, an associate professor at the Chemical and Materials Engineering Department. Uh, his expertise is on welding, of course, and mathematical modeling of the welding processes. Uh, he is also the director of CCWJ, and most importantly, at least for me, he is from MIT. <laughs> uh, so without any further detail, uh, de delay, uh, I'll hand it over to Dr. Mendes. All right, thank you, Abby. <laughs> all right, uh, thank you all of you guys for being here, and uh, yeah, I want to extend a warm welcome to, to our visitors from St. Joe's. So, uh, my experience with welding is that uh, once you, you try it, and uh, once you do you, your little hands on and you try a little bit, it's hard to pull people away from wanting to keep trying and to get better and better and better. So, uh, truly, like a, welding brings this type of joy that it can be addictive in some cases. Uh, and uh, the interesting thing is that you can be a great welder even if you don't know how to read and write. It's a little bit like being a great musician. You can be great. Uh, but now, if you wanted to make a violin, if you wanted to be a Stradivarius, you need to know a lot. Actually, a lot more than is normal in, uh, for, for many other engineering disciplines. So that will be my topic. But before I get into the topic, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, because I have a captive audience, so I might as well do it, right? I'm from Buenos Aires, that's where the charming accent is. And uh, I, uh, I'm a mechanical engineer. I think we have one representative from mechanical, right? And all the rest of you are probably materials, right? Uh, so I, um, I actually was a pioneer. I used to do wind energy in the 80s. Now I saw the light and I do oil and gas. And, uh, <laughs> You might have heard about Buenos Aires. Uh, you know who that is, right? Yes. All right. So you might not know that the department head in uh, electrical engineering here is from Argentina, as it is the department head in uh, physics, or the head of the department of math in this university. So Argentina is kind of a hot country these days. <laughs> That's the queen of Netherlands. She might happens to be from Buenos Aires too. How about that? <laughs> Is there anybody else famous from Argentina these days? There you go. <laughs> oh, no, wrong photo. <laughs> so, uh, those are the good old days, huh? So th then, uh, from uh, Argentina, here at the end of the world, that color according to his holiness, so it must be true, huh? It's, uh, we, uh, I, I jumped all the way to Boston, I did my master's, I did my PhD, I didn't want to, to leave, so I did a postdoc. Uh, I was one of those chronic students. Um, one of the interesting things, I had my own startup. I um, started a company with some friends. We invented a machine. Uh, we licensed it to Ford. Uh, actually, all the Ford focused uh, with a Zetec engine between 98 and 2003. I have a part made in my machine. At one point, I thought my main worry in life was going to be to find a woman who loves me for who I am and not for my money. And that got sold. <laughs> then uh, I uh, uh, became a professor. That is what, what I what really wanted to do. I in uh, Colorado School of Mines in Denver, and uh, I, I was teaching welding there. Uh, this photo here, uh, I take pride on this. This is the highest paved road in North America. This is Mount Evans. It's what they call a 14 or 14,000 feet. Uh, I did it twice. The first time is this, and I'm smiling. The second time I did it after it was a father. And without training, and I was not smiling. <laughs> but, uh, um, here at U of A, uh, actually got stolen. Huh? It's uh, um, when I, I got to meet people from Alberta and see all that is going on in the province and uh, what the university is planning. I was very, very impressed, and I made the jump. Uh, I sometimes have to explain this to people, but. Um, they are puzzled. No way. This place, you guys, are uh, very, very lucky to, to be here. 
Uh, I think this province is the center of the world, and I think uh, this uh, engineering school is very, very, very strong. And I showed that with uh, my feet, right? I, coming here. I, uh, we, we teach a class, Fundamentals of Welding, that uh, if all goes right, we'll be offering for undergraduates this coming fall. Um, we offer a class on welding. We used to offer a class on welding metallurgy that I'm hoping to reestablish again uh, this coming winter or the one after. Uh, I, used, I, I taught phase transformations here too for a while. Uh, I'm now teaching Mighty 202 and uh, Colloquium. And it's a lot of fun teaching Colloquium. And uh, I'm here as the director of the Canadian Center for Welding and Joining. Let, let me uh, show you a little bit more about that. So, U of A used to have a welding program uh, that was led by uh, Professor Patchett, and then he retired, and uh, welding went away, and I don't think many people cried about it until people from industry said, you know what, we cannot find a single engineer that we hired that would know anything about welding. And guess what? Everything is about welding in this province. Uh, so the dean said, I feel your pain. I can fix it. Oh, really? You can? Yes. But it's going to cost you. And, uh, and the, the dean talked people into putting money in an endowment. And this endowment that uh, when it's all complete will be three and a half million dollars. Uh, an endowment is when people put money in the bank just because they like this university. And uh, then from the interest, you run things. I don't get to see any of this, by the way. I, uh, but um, so uh, universities like Harvard or my own MIT, they're very big into endowments. And the typical endowments come from old people dying and saying, oh, I, I love so much my school, this school. I'm going to give it some money. In this case, nobody died. It's all active companies who believe that a welding program should be started at the university. And they put their money where their mouth is. And, uh, and that's how we started our uh, program. Uh, the companies involved are uh, the lead companies Wealthco, but some other of the companies you might be familiar with, like Sinkert and Suncor. Uh, some others like uh, Lincoln and Miller are the largest manufacturers of welding equipment. Since we see pressure vessel manufacturing. And we have here a long list of many other companies who, although are not part of this endowment, have been uh, helping us, sometimes with big projects, sometimes with small projects, sometimes with uh, giving us uh, consumables or materials. Um, if there's any take home message from this slide, is we're rather well connected. And uh, that, that's, uh, that's very good because I enjoy very much that the deep things I'm gonna uh, discuss are all in the framework of uh, a pressing needs uh, for, from people who need it for a living. Here we have a photo of the group. We have the, 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 uh, the list of uh, people currently involved. Uh, here we have uh, one of our fine representatives, Nair and Boris, uh, there. Um, uh, we have rather good equipment. We have about a million, between a million and a million and a half dollars in equipment. I think it's closer to a million and a half. And uh, here you get to see our robot in action. We have a hardness mapper, an instrumented impact tester, uh, hydrogen chromatographer. Um, <clears throat> much of this equipment has been donated or in consignment from the welding companies who, wants to, who want to be very involved in the program. And I take pride that being a university and discussing differential equations and all the type of things we do at a university, the people who need to weld for a living still choose us as the, their, their, their point, the focal point in Alberta for welding technology. So that's a great thing. Um, so let me tell you some about welding then. Uh, well, um, outside there, and I think many of you, well, and I tell uh, the, the St. Joe's uh, people, many of you might not be uh, fully familiar with what's the story with welding, right? I, I mean, there is a big spark and whatever. So here, here you have a ship, and I'm keeping on the, the Argentinian theme. Uh, this ship is sunk uh, right outside Buenos Aires. It's in, it's in, the, the, uh, in, in the river that is the entrance there. Uh, anybody familiar with the graph speed? Any World War II buffs? Okay, so after World War I, Germany was forbidden from making big battleships for the obvious reasons they didn't want it. So what the way around for Germany was to make battleships. 
that would meet the, the, the tonnage requirement that was low, and they were big after all. And the, the craft speed is one of those. And you know what was the difference? But the Germans figured out how to weld the ships instead of rivet them. Because if you rivet them, you, you overlap the plates. And yeah, that's extra weight there. So they uh, figure out, among other things, how to develop low hydrogen consumables for the high strength steel. And uh, made this ship that was pretty big, pretty powerful, and, um, I, I met the, the tonnage that, the, that was in, in the armistice. So uh, to give you an idea, just to chase this ship, the, the, the British developed a, sent a, a, a little fleet chasing after it. Eventually, it got sunk when, when they all ganged up on, on, on it. Now, this is, for the Germans, was a good thing when they knew what they were doing. Conversely, our neighbors south of the border sometimes didn't know what they were doing with their welding. And this is another World War II ship. These are the cargos. These are the, the Liberty ships, right, that were mass produced to cross Atlantic. And uh, um, they were made pretty quickly. and. Uh, it's somewhat sloppy, and in this ship in particular, uh, a crack started midline in, in a weld and uh, cracked the, the ship in, in, in half. We have this awesome photo because this ship was moored. Well, there are many for which we don't have photos because this happened in the middle of the ocean. So, welding for you, good when you know what it is, how to, what it's involved, bad when you don't. Uh, welding uh, here. Uh, di different types of welding and uh, how it relates to what you'd say is the ultimate technology, right? Aerospace. Uh, the A380, um, this uh, latest and largest Airbus, this is laser beam welded. And the, the whole principle behind it is just the same as, as the craft speed. No overlap, let's weld it, we'll be lighter, and you want that. Um, you know how they, 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 they pulled it off? They stole all the the welding engineers from the Soviet Union after the Soviet Union collapsed. That's, uh, I, I was at the meetings as they were developing this. Um, and they, uh, you, you have different types of welding, some of them done in, uh, for the, the jet engines, uh, for example, jet fighters, like this one. In the jet engine, you don't want to have the, the blades being removable because that takes weight and space. So you, you weld them, uh, and you have what is called a blisk. It's a mixture of the blade and a disc. Um, that's all about welding. Different types of welding and make different types of airplane. This airplane is also welded. Um, rockets, how about that? The, the, um, the moon mission, right? The, the one that was eventually accomplished with Apollo 11. They, they were meant to uh, put a man on the moon and retrieve him safely by the end of the decade. However, they almost didn't make it for two reasons. One is they had problems in the installation of the uh, hydrogen tank um, that, that's, uh, uh, that, that was one of the problems. And the other, they couldn't properly weld the aluminum. I think it was uh, stage two. So that, that's pretty interesting that, an almost, that a welding problem almost derails the whole uh, uh, space race. Uh, cars, modern cars, they're made you, you would say that a car is made out of steel, but uh, the different colors show the different types of steels. You go crazy how many different types of steel there, there are involved and uh, um, what the subtleties are. But the bottom line is that they're difficult to weld. And uh, if it is difficult to weld, that's not a car that would qualify in a crash test. So welding is a big deal. And for example, uh, when you want to, the, the reason we have, few to non-aluminum cars, like the Audi A8 is an aluminum car, and they are made completely different than a steel car, because they cannot commercially, practically, practically, economically weld aluminum. So these cars are made with a, a, a frame structure that was similar to those cars in the 1940s. That's pretty interesting. Um, so you, you get to see that the relevance of welding in, in, in very important choices in technology that affects us. Well, here we're in Alberta, and let me tell you, those guys are welded all right, and uh, plenty more things are welded uh, when you go uh, to the oil patch. Here, pipelines, buildings, uh, platforms, but if you think that welding is just dry for technology, 
this is art. I took this photo at the uh, uh, art foundry that was in Colorado. And you might not know, but sculptures are made in little chunks. And it, for example, for this big horse, you can tell it's a horse. And uh, all of each of these is cast separately. And they have all the texture of the hair that the artist made. And then, after they cast it, they have to weld it together. There you have the welder. So, and I'm not even talking about welded uh, as an art in itself, but as an essential part of other branches of art. So, welding has a big impact. If you see these numbers, these are big numbers. But uh, if, if I tell you that in for the U.S. that I had some stats, uh, people every household spends about three hundred twenty-five dollars each year in welding products. Of course, you. You don't go to the shop, to the store, and say, give me some welding product. You buy things that are welded, and that cost is sunk into your welding. Whatever it is, $325 for the US. Here's Canada, $455. If you do the same accounting, so here in Canada, and uh, mostly because of the, 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 how intense and how preponderant natural resources are, uh, welding is more, uh, it has a lot uh, more weight because if you don't weld it, you don't get the minerals, you don't get the oil, you don't get anything. You're gonna weld it. Um, let me show you this. This is old stats, uh, but I don't think they have, might have changed all that much. Look, the different cities with manufacturing, uh, with manufacturing uh, operations. Um, pick one outside Edmonton, right? Even our friends south of, the, south of here. Uh, Montreal, Ottawa, Toronto. They are all decreasing. Look at Edmonton going up. That tells you something. And uh, Edmonton is one of the, the cities that are growing the fastest in all Canada. I think it's the one. Anyway, joining. So I told you, I was going to tell you about the complexities of welding. I told you about the joy. I told you what is important. And I'll tell you more about the joy in a minute. But what, what is welding? So. Uh, I think the best definition is uh, this is the, the motto of the Welding Institute in English, in England. So, eduobus unum. So, in Latin America, I speak Latin. So, um, so uh, this means from two to make one. So, and that, that's ultimately what you want. The ideal joint is a no joint. Great, but go, go do that. There are different alternatives. One is having adhesives or, or brazing or soldering in which you add a third material, right? Now, those materials you add, if it is an adhesive, for example, will have the properties of a polymer, which are much inferior than the properties of a metal. So, for a pipeline, for example, this would not cut it. Uh, you can do mechanical joining. The good thing of mechanical joining is reversible. The bad thing of mechanical joining are issues of uh, space, cost, and maintenance, uh, for example, in some um, the, the tailings uh, lines in the, in the oil sands operators are often mechanically, the, the, those pipelines are mechanically joined because they were out so much and they need to change it so frequently, they gave up on welding. Uh, other types of uh, welding would be solid state in which uh, you somehow deform the material and until the, the two materials get together, friction welding, friction strip welding, forge welding, explosive welding, right? Actually, the earliest welding process is a solid state process, that is uh, forge welding. That means you get two pieces of uh, metal and you hammer them to death, they eventually become one, right? That's uh, what the Egyptians would do. Uh, now, if you get a little bit more modern, you get into fusion welding, which you melt a little bit. Uh, here you have a photo of the art taken at the lab. And, and here you have the, the part, the schematic of what you would melt. What is important about this is if you melt a little bit, the liquid will take care of all the imperfections in, in size. And when the liquid goes solid, then you have the two parts that became one. Right? And uh, um, of course, in the fact of going from solid, liquid to solid, there are some problems. Uh, those of you in Mali know all, everything. Uh, about the solidification, right, the structures, issues of toughness, uh, porosity, you know, all things that can happen. Um, what is, I find myself especially interesting about 
welding is it is by definition a non-equilibrium process. What do I mean by non-equilibrium? So equilibrium is if you the, the, you reach the point at which things don't want to change anymore. But guess what? Here you have solid. Here you have molten metal. So if I keep hitting these, it will keep growing and growing. And I mean, I cannot have everything molten, right? That would be pretty bad. That's casting, right? And, uh, but if I don't melt it, I don't join it. So you just have to create this localized melting point, right? This localized uh, temperature field that should not be too big and should not be too small. And uh, it has to be just right. What is amazing is that people figured this out and did it right way before they wrote any heat transfer equations. The most basic heat transfer equations for calculating this are from after World War II. They were developed by uh, Rosenthal, that was a professor at MIT. So people were welding all those ships without knowing what they were doing. But it worked, huh? Isn't that great? But um, So here I have a, a little list of uh, things that, you, that are typically used in Alberta. All of these we have in the lab, except uh, uh, well, lasers, which we use little here, and I, I believe it's growing. And uh, you, you might, uh, you'll get to see that they have these like funny-looking acronyms. And by the time you spend a little bit of time welding, they become second nature because they mean a lot. So, about the difficulties of welding, I told you how you want to put two things together, how, in in the most practical case, that is fusion welding. You, you want to melt a little bit, and then you, 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 but not too much and not too little. So to accomplish that, you need lots of things. You need to understand your solid mechanics because of the heat transfer, and also when things get solid. You have all these temperatures that created uh, distortions, and they leave residual stresses. Um, you need to understand your metallurgy, and I don't need to say too much about that, uh, that the heat makes a mess in your metal. If you have, for example, you're welding pipeline steel, the, the, uh, the pipeline steel is so carefully thermomechanically processed. Uh, not only do you get the right alloy, but they get the right uh, amount of rolling and the right amount of quench and temper. And then you come with your welding torch, you melt everything. And then you would like that weld to have the same properties as the, as the pipeline, but you are not going to roll it again, right? It's. Uh, uh, well, you see how we, we earn a living. Uh, we, you, you need to uh, understand some basics of electrical engineering because uh, m most modern welding is based on electricity, even lasers. And, uh, but even more, mo the, the, the latest generations of welding machines are essentially a computer attached to a power source. So the that you, you have this big juice that comes from the current of the power source, but you have a computer that about 20,000 times per second is sensing what is going on with current and voltage and adapting according to an algorithm that would, has been programmed. So by now, as a user, you have a welding machine that tries as hard as you, that they can, the manufacturers, to be transparent to you. But under the hood, there is big number of things uh, going on. Uh, that are very complex. Uh, civil engineering at system level performance when you make a joint. Uh, and, and there are even more things because after you weld something, it doesn't matter if you welded it right or wrong because if you don't test it, how do you know? So testing be becomes very important. So you have to be a good welder and then you have to measure it and know how to measure it. This is NDT. Things of economics play a role. Uh, many of the decisions are based on economics. So. Uh, I didn't tell you much about the difficulty, but for sure you know you you, you get to the sense that you need to know a lot. Um, I will focus. I'll have a few slides on the difficulty, and I'll discuss them from the point of view of the process of the, the heat transfer and the fluid flow, uh, and even before the metal goes solid, what's going on in welding, and, and, and you, you get to set. Uh, have a sense of why you need uh, to understand this. Not only you need to be an engineer, but you need to be an engineer who logs the hours reading the, the literature and trying to, to understand things. <coughs> so uh, 
what dominates the process of the act of welding is what we call transport processes. Heat transfer, fluid flow, diffusion, right? And you can write the equations for this. And typically equations are not all that complex, except that the boundary conditions make it very awkward. For example, you have a free surface. A free surface means this. It's like the surface of a, it is the surface of a liquid. So what is the shape of it? Well, you don't know. So how do you calculate it if you don't know the shape? It becomes a coupled problem in which the, the, the shape influences the, the fluid flow, and the fluid flow influences the shape. Um, for the point of view of the arc, the, the big spark you see, that big spark has three times the temperature of the surface of the sun. 20,000 Kelvin. The surface of the sun is 6,000 Kelvin. And uh, to, to um, the, the velocity at which this plasma is a plasma, the, the plasma moves, is the, the velocity that if it was room temperature would be the speed of sound. It's about 300 meters per second. To, to, under, to put all this together, you need to use the equations of magnetohydrodynamics. Uh, these equations were developed by this guy, Hans Alpben, who for, was studying the, 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 the plasma on the surface of the sun. And for doing that, he got the Nobel Prize. And, and this is part of welding. It's not that welding is small compared to this. This is only part of welding. You still need to know or your metallurgy, your distortions. So let, let's talk for a second about how fast you can go when you weld. This is uh, relevant for mechanized welding. So in mechanized welding, <coughs> you could argue that uh, if you increase your welding current, that means you put more juice into it, you could go faster. And the uh, funny thing is that that's true to some extent, but it's to something that is like a speed limit, you just cannot cross. I mean, you can double the, the power and you can double the current, but there's a point at which it doesn't work anymore because your weld becomes all in the form of like beads. And uh, there's a long tradition of funny words in, uh, in welding terminology, so this is called humping. Uh, and there are all these types of humping and uh, they are somehow related and they're uh, an unhappy family. You're not going to see welds like this in the field, of course, because they get rejected, right? But if you could uh, weld any faster than you do, especially in mechanized processes, you would, right? So uh, people say, I never see this effect. Uh, that, that doesn't matter. Well, sure, you don't see that effect, but you also don't weld any faster. And here you have some examples. Uh, I, I took some of these photos myself once upon a time when I was a student. So uh, to do this, uh, and I'm giving you a little demo of how we study a welding problem in our lab, you'd focus in what we call the weld pool, that is the, the part, the puddle, the, the molten part that the, welding, the welder is seeing. Should not be too big because then you melt everything, should not be too small because then you don't melt enough and things don't get joined. And uh, here you have some, some photos. This would be the arc. Uh, for those of you who know, this would be a thick torch. And, uh, and uh, this is the, the shape of the weld pool with the, the depression in the puddle and the molten metal here and the weld bead behind. And uh, if you remember, I gave you a little list of uh, the physics that were involved. So here is a, a schematic drawing of this photo I showed you. And you have things like inertial forces, viscous forces, hydrostatic forces, buoyancy, uh, conduction, heat transfer, convection, heat transfer, electromagnetic uh, uh, forces, uh, a free surface, uh, gas shear from the plasma, arc pressure, and Marangoni uh, flows. And by the way, for my PhD, I wrote the formula, the, the, the equation for each one of these is a partial differential equation, and I solved it. And uh, I think I earned my PhD, right? And, uh, and then you have to figure out if they matter, don't matter. Uh, oh, I forgot, capillary forces. <clears throat> and the funny thing is that all these forces that I show you here, they depend on each other. So you cannot calculate one without knowing the other. For example, uh, <clears throat> if you consider the inertial and viscous forces of fluid mechanics, these fluid mechanics, they're influenced by this Marangoni boundary condition, whatever it is, uh, probably some of Mr. Marangoni would be happy that, that people still use the, this equation, right? Uh, hydrostatic uh, forces, uh, buoyancy, electromagnetic forces affected, fr free surface, as I mentioned, free, they give you the shape of the well pool, they, they matter. All these things 
influence my fluid mechanic, my fluid dynamics. Now, uh, I can also tell you that these inertial forces influence my heat transfer, conduction and convection, and they influence my the shape of the of my puddle. Now, <clears throat> I was just focusing on the inertia, the, the fluid mechanics, and I told you what influences it and what they influence. Now, if I do the same for uh, each one of these forces, and, and I did it, and this is each of these lines represents a, a term in the equations. Now it, it looks like, like the, 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 the map of uh, United Airlines uh, flights uh, all across the country, right? Like uh, so, you 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 have like things influencing each other in a complex way. This is not random. This is each of them a term in the equation. So you get to see, for example, that. Inertial forces influence uh, fluid mechanics, influence the, the shape of the puddle, the puddle influences fluid mechanics. That's coupling. You cannot do one without the other. You can have coupling of uh, uh, fluid mechanics influence heat transfer. Heat transfer influences the, the what is called the buoyancy, the force that makes the, the fluids go up, the hot fluids go up. But the hot fluids go up, going up influence my fluid mechanics. And now we have a coupling of three. And have another coupling of three, coupling of four, you, you choose, right? I mean, pick your poison. So, uh, uh, so I did this, the, the guys in the lab do similar things, and uh, they, they, they talk about that too. And uh, in the end, from this point of humping, how can we avoid it? We, we came to some, uh, to some sort of understanding that here you have the, the, the plasma arc and with heat uh, that heats up all this thin part, the depressed part in the metal. And, uh, but sometimes, and we calculated when, you might have that the heat <coughs> doesn't reach all the way to the back. And this little thin part here that is of the order of 30 microns is very thin. This can go solid. And now the, the liquid, the molten metal, cannot go to the back anymore. And you get to see how a new ball starts to generate. So I, I gave you a, my holistic hand-waving explanation. All this can be done very rigorously. Uh, and you get to see, to understand something like this, how deep we need to go. Um, I Myself, I did it mostly in a theoretical form. But now at the lab we have, it is uh, so amazing and so, so complete that uh, we um, some of the guys, as undergraduate projects, uh, here are these, these two guys. Here we have uh, Ryan and Mac, uh, actually both uh, in, in Mackie. And they did a, a DRA, a, um, a DS research award in the lab. And uh, they used the, the high speed cameras we have. And they did what I, I wish I had done when I was doing my PhD. But I, uh, I didn't have uh, the, the right tools. So this video is, you, you'll see. You get to see this. This is the the puddle, right? And uh, and this is the, the torch. And we are using special filters to to filter the ultraviolet light. And what we are seeing here is uh, infrared, actually. So we don't get to see the arc because it has relatively low components in the infrared. And uh, we get to see here the molten metal. We get to see here how the molten metal tries to come to the back, how here this, uh, the heat wasn't enough to melt, right? And uh, th this is going slow because we, we showed it at, at high speed. Right? And, and in doing this type of, uh, of uh, uh, videos, we get to see things in reality and, and uh, that make sense for, uh, of them. I'll tell you, I can write a lot of equations after I see this. The funny thing was writing equations when you don't know any, when you didn't see anything. But uh, we do what we can, and now we can do a lot more than I could at my time. Uh, I think I have another good video for this. Uh, let me see. Then you, you'll get to see it from this side, and it's a lot more similar to the. There you go. So now you, you're seeing this from this side. Uh, here you have the torch. This is the arc that we filter the heavily. 
we're melting the metal. You see, this is the base plate, and you get to see the, the droplets. And here you get to see what happens when the heat didn't reach it, and it went solid. It doesn't re-wet. And see all the, all the liquid going to the back? And that is filling up one of these beads. So based on this, uh, companies like uh, Early Kid have filed for patents for gas combinations and processes to avoid this problem. Right? So I, 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 I'm especially proud that of two things. Number one, that it's useful. And number two, that the things I derive in theory actually match reality when we have a chance to look at reality directly. So that's not to be underestimated. Materials issues. Um, um, I myself enjoy my heat transfer and my fluid flow, but um, once uh, the material uh, goes solid, you have a whole lot of things going on, lots. You might have heard about the heat affected zone, uh, that is that part of the world that, was, that gets very hot and the, the base material gets degraded. Um, something in which we put a lot of emphasis in our lab. I, I did expect this when I came. I didn't expect that would be almost an, an almost exclusive emphasis is on overlays for wear protection. Now here's the story. Uh, we have the oil sands. There are very few other places in the world with oil sands, and we're the only ones exploiting it. Oil sands are extremely abrasive in addition to being in pretty cold places. Now, do you guys think that you can go and buy off-the-shelf technology for that? Well, I guarantee you, the answer is no. So here in Canada, we're forced to develop our own technologies. I'm happy for that because I wanted to do it anyway. So the, the, the things people are using are things that we have to develop here. And, uh, and our lab is a key player in, into those things. So here you get to see um, two cross sections of uh, the, the type of uh, materials we do. And, and here is a schematic of the, the technology we uh, across the, uh, side, the longitudinal section of the technology we use. Uh, what you see in colors are carbides. In this case, are tungsten carbides that, for good reasons, people want to use, but they are very difficult to use. Uh, and uh, you get to see that uh, we developed this software here in, a, in, a, in our lab, and we're pretty, pretty excited about it because we can count carbide by carbide individually what the size is and make size distributions and statistics. And um, so the, the matrix here is nickel. And for example, one of the challenges in this type of alloy is that uh, actually, um, I have a slide on that, so I'm gonna, I'll tell you about this. Here you, you have a, a, another image that's more of a classical metallurgy image where you have nickel matrix and the tungsten carbides. Um, what is uh, especially interesting about this alloy is that the, the carbides that are very expensive and very hard they want to dissolve in the molten nickel. Now, if they dissolve in the molten nickel, they don't do anything good for you from the point of view of wear resistance. So how can you put these carbides in molten nickel and avoid the dissolution? Well, if you have an answer, tell me. But that's what we're trying to figure it out. And I think we're making pretty, pretty good headway. Um, so this uh, type of technology is not necessarily new, but the details at which we care are uh, very deep, and we care not only about the details of the metallurgy, but also about what type of technologies we can use to apply these, these materials that are so difficult. Other type of uh, alloy with which we're working quite a bit, actually, Naren is uh, the real expert, is uh, cone carbide uh, alloys. These are very different than the tungsten carbide, right? You say carbide, and it should all be the same, but tungsten carbides want to dissolve. And that's bad. Now, chrome carbides want to appear, and that's good. They're a lot easier to deposit. These alloys are cheaper, easier. Almost everything is better, except one thing. The tungsten carbides have a lot better wear performance. So sometimes you have to use tungsten carbides as much as you can. right? And, uh, and these other ones uh, have this uh, very interesting microstructure in which uh, what comes primary to its solidification is uh, M7C3, that is, uh, that is a, a chrome, some type of chrome carbide with some iron, 
And the matrix you get to see here is a eutectic that, uh, uh, that involved in carbides and, and essentially the iron. So we're studying all these things. Um, to give you an idea, even getting this picture is not trivial. Because these, these alloys are designed not to be worn out. First of all, try to cut it. We figure it out. Now polish it. They don't want to be polished because they were designed not to be not to wear out. Uh, in fact, that you see this uh, photo means uh, we figure it out. But uh, all this is learning and expertise we, we are developing in this lab. We do quite a bit of outreach. I already mentioned some. We're pretty. I I uh, I I, uh, I brag about being having started in our uh, university the first university chapter so. Uh, Canadian Welding Association or the American Welding Association in all of Canada. That's us. Um, we also host quite a few open labs, and you get to see some photos. Um, and you might have gotten emails, right, going around inviting people to come and try welding hands-on. And uh, that, that is going very well. Last time, because of a mistake in the problems in sending the emails. We didn't send the email until the day before, and even that way, we, we signed uh, two, two, um, two sessions of 20 people each overnight. That, that tells you about some interest in welding. So, uh, so far, about 850 people have come through, through our lab or classes and learned about welding. Um, and uh, I'd like to finish here. Here are the acknowledgments. You have the people that uh, we're grateful to. And you, you, you'll get to see, maybe this face is familiar to you because it used to be one of you, one of you uh, uh, until last uh, summer. And uh, this is a good use of the, <laughs> of the high-speed cameras, uh, which of course, uh, no animals were injured in the production of this movie, right? <laughs> <laughs> so here you have a hand and face, uh, but then you can have the, the, the face and hand reverted. Let's see. This is the one I just showed you. Let's see. Yeah, now it's reverse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would not have that smile. Let me tell you.
Anyway. Well, if any of these students do want to get into this room, like, what kind of stream would they want to take through the university to get into this? Mm -hmm. if, uh, well, uh, we are part of the chemical and materials engineering department, but it, uh, the bottom line is it, it, anybody in engineering can uh, join uh, the, the lab uh, through the Dean's Research Award. And uh, we have been having people coming from uh, other departments and other places too, right? So if uh, you're interested, I, I'll talk to anybody. Uh, once uh, you get excited, only good things can happen. Yeah, uh, you mentioned that next semester there might be, uh, in the fall semester, there might yeah. be. Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty, pretty, pretty sure of that. Uh, I haven't heard of anything about that. Where could I get it? Um, we, we, we should advertise, but uh, if, if you uh, send me an email, I'll, I'll make sure that uh, to, to let you know when that is, that is up. That course it has to be arranged yet, mm -hmm. so, so it's not listed yet. Okay. And then is that just like a, a general course, or is it like connected to a department? Will be a MADI course. Mad uh, I don't remember the number, but there is a, a, a number for the uh, courses that are done, uh, that are started, like this one. So Dr. Mendes, like you mentioned that uh, welding is like art mm -hmm. and every welder, a good welder will do a good weld. Well. So but like these days, a lot of robotics is induced in your welding for precision and accuracy, right? And you might, and you also use a lot of uh, computational fluid dynamics mm -hmm. to mo model everything. So how do you think is the future of like the Alberta industry is going toward, is it gonna go towards the use of robotics or it's still going to rely on human welding. Well, no, that, that, that has a clear answer. So, uh, number one, human welding is never going to go away. Oh yeah. Because wh when you need to, to weld a, a piece of pipe in for Mac, you don't have robots around, mm -hmm. right? So that's never going to go away. And, and, and the guys who are the crack teams that show up and fix whatever needs to be fixed will keep making lots of money and will require lots of skills. Uh, what I see as the immediate future is people uh, shifting, there are different types of welding processes. One, let's call it stick, because you have this stick that you burn out, and after you burn it out, you use a new one. Okay, Th that's, uh, th that is the, the predominant type of welding used right now. Now you mentioned that if instead of having a stick, you have a spool of wire that constantly comes out, you'll have less fear starts and stops, and uh, uh, you can do it manually too. You need somewhat different uh, type of skills at the welder level. I think that will be the, 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 uh, the first thing, and we're already in the process of, uh, of, of moving in, in, in that direction. Uh, it's not going to happen overnight because it requires retraining of people or, or bringing new people, but um, I, I'm sure you, you guys are fu fully aware about like using these synergic machines and all, all those things. That's, uh, that's very important. Uh, if we can accomplish that, that would be a, a, a hu huge thing for the province, but um, in addition to that, uh, automation at any level, not only robotics, but sometimes putting things in the gantry, that's, a, that's another big deal. Companies like uh, our, the main sponsor of our endowment, Welco, they, uh, they um, invested quite a bit of money and, uh, and risk into robotics, and it's paying off enormously. It's, it's, a, it's a great thing for them. Those, of course, those are based on these wire-based processes. And I think uh, automation is another important thing uh, coming to the province. Uh, another thing I see over the horizon is some amount of lasers. I don't think lasers are essential uh, to, to the province, but there are some things they can do that nothing else can do. Now, once you get, uh, you generated a credibility, a reputation about, uh, with your lasers, you may get business in lasers, 
even when some other technologies could also do it. And I see that growing, too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I know you guys already had an open lab, but are you guys planning on having another one sometime? Are you bet? It's yeah. going to go on. No, like this semester. There should be one uh, March 27th. But we're not. That's 10. Okay. Yeah. 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 We, 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 it's not a hobby shop for the most part, right? Uh, the, the students uh, that have projects, they, they work uh, never alone in the lab, but they, they have individual responsibilities. But, um, and, and sometimes we host the people from Formula SAE. Or, uh, okay. uh, we, we also help the people from the, the concrete toboggan, right, uh, to do those things. And uh, when we need to put things together, we put them in, in, uh, in, in the lab. But, um, yeah, we, we do, when it's the open lab, you can come and try anything you want. But for the most part, we don't have people trying their own, uh, make their own lamp uh, at the lab, which would be cool, right? But it, it involves uh, a lot of uh, attention and, and effort that right now we, we couldn't do. Yeah. You mentioned some of the processes like stir friction. Do you have any machines here? We do. You're, you're going to see it. And uh, uh, I don't know if we have a demo plan for it. Will depend on Jordan or the same thing. Yeah, you, you're going to see that in action, right? Awesome. So. Yeah. Um, one of my TAs, Stuart, he's mm -hmm. studying uh, well, master's, I believe. And yeah. he's saying that um, like there's only like five schools who do specialized law. And uh, well, you said like when you studied it before, like it wasn't that big of an event, and now that the industry starting to, uh, I guess, like, hope universities to get more involved, do you think a lot more students are going to start going into it? You ask a good question. So it, it, interesting, like, uh, right here in Canada, uh, uh, having an a, a intense focus on welding, like, a, a, beyond being a, a, a professor, right, uh, it's uh, us and the University of Waterloo. There are actually the only university chapters of CWA or AWS too, right? Um, and uh, the industry is very interested in, in training uh, engineers. And uh, I think there is a hot demand for it. The, the people, uh, the, the industry would call them welding engineers. An engineer is an engineer, but engineers who know, that can make sense out of welding, right? Uh, when you weld a pressure vessel, how many volts, how many amps, at what velocity, what electrode? Who decides that? Okay. Uh, it, 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 we're hard pressed to find those people, right? Uh, so yeah, yeah. I, um, I, w with um, much of a nanotechnology or biotechnology, the focus of uh, much academic engineering is being moved, moved in that direction. I, I do expect to have a, a, a come back to, to uh, disciplines like uh, manufacturing or metallurgy. There's a lot to be said. Very, very challenging academically and intellectually. Um, and actually, lots of people need the answers. Yeah. All right, guys. Thank you very, very, very much. Yeah.